Well, th thank you everybody for uh, for attending our session. This is one of the run-up events to um, 5G Week and uh, 5G Realize, which will be uh, 7th to 11th of September and 9th to 10th for 5G Realized. And the whole thing is really, I mean, the theme for it is uh, moving from use case to business case for 5G. And um, I wanted to uh, shake things up a bit. So we've got Dean Bubbly here. I wanted a bit of a bit more disruptive analysis. So <laughs> Dean is Mr. Disruptive Analysis, and he will be leading the panel today. Just a, a couple of housekeeping comments just to kick off. Uh, please, um, any comments on the subject matter, any things you'd like the panel to discuss, just pop them on the chat on the right hand side. If you're having any issues with connectivity, I know, if, you know, from time to time people are. Don't put it there, please. Um, keep it to the, the subject of the panel. Contact um, Nigel Yates. You'll find him if you click on the people column and Nigel's there to help you out. So, um, uh, Dean, without any further ado, I'll uh, hand over to you. Thanks, Michael. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we've got a, uh, a, a really interesting panel session today with uh, a number of introduce them in a few minutes. Um, we've battled a little bit with the platform because we have a maximum number of, of screens we can have on simultaneously. But uh, a quick introduction. Um, first off, uh, um, I'm Dean Bubbly, sometimes uh, disruptive Dean on Twitter, as uh, we'll find out there's a, a few contrarian opinions I have. And we're really focusing today on what is the impact on industry 4.0 whether that's manufacturing or other industrial sectors from the 5g era and i'll use this term 5g era um, because uh, that's um, uh, yeah, essentially more than just the standard industry definition of 5g um, technically, 5G is a specific set of radio and core network standards, but actually the expanded sort of perception of 5G includes other technologies, um, and uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll cover that as well. So I've got a couple of slides to kick off. I mean, literally only three slides, and then we'll dive straight into the conversation. I just wanted to set the scene up a bit. Um, I'm an industry analyst. I've been covering um, private use of cellular networks and small cells since about 2001. Um, so it's nice to see everything suddenly actually happening in reality and accelerating with the availability of spectrum, um, later versions of 4G and 5G, uh, and also all of the cloud-based technologies and infrastructure um, that goes around it. So really, um, what's worth me focusing on is that, that there's more than just one trend going on at the moment and we're seeing the intersection of multiple different trends around um, the future of cellular networks today we're going to talk about uh, enterprise industrial private cellular networks um, also we're seeing those starting to be used for more wide area things like utility companies building their own networks oil and gas pipelines and so on but particularly an in interest at the moment is um, things like ports uh, manufacturing sites um, it could be airports, warehouses, and logistics centers, uh, industrial uh, locations, uh, and what they can do with their own wireless networks, which are capable of either handling mobility, high bandwidth, low latency, uh, and so on. Uh, and some of those are going to be uh, 4G, and some are in, you know, trending towards 5G, and then later versions of 5G as the standards evolve. But these don't um, exist in an isolation. There's a couple of other trends that are going on. First off, we're seeing what I call microcellular networks, whether that's on ships or islands or small isolated rural communities building their own networks um, and there's also a, another phenomenon called neutral host um, which is more a wholesale or shared network model either for uh, indoor use or rural uh, use or perhaps uh, dense metro areas where a wholesale cellular provider um, builds out an infrastructure and allows the other operators to either roam or share infrastructure and assets or interconnect in other ways. And there are some overlaps between this. So you'll see, for example, uh, the mobile operators offering localized campus networks uh, for industry. That's that's becoming uh, a huge trend uh, in a number of parts of the world. Or that overlaps with the concept of network slicing in 5G, allowing the public network, uh, the national networks uh, in the UK, to offer um, a customized 
um, virtual network for particular uses or perhaps in future specific companies or locations. Uh, and we'll probably hear about that uh, over the next uh, hour or so. Um, there's different ways of looking at private networks um, and, and whether they start from um, the small application specific use cases of private cellular. I've seen one example which almost had like one camera in one factory connected across the factory to a um, machine learning and analytic system to analyze welding. Um, and that was a application specific. On the other hand, there are people who are building out complete networks for a port or a manufacturing plant or even larger, such as a utility grid or a, a, an oil field or an offshore uh, wind turbine field. And it's not a, immediately obvious whether the dominant use of 5G for industrial IoT will be at the micro level, the midsize, or the national level uh, to begin with, or a combination of all of them. And it's something to watch out for, and, and maybe we'll drill into that in the panel. One last thing I, I would say is that 5G, whether that's public network or private network, is not the only game in town. Um, there's a lot going on with Wi-Fi. And what my general view is that um, the use cases don't overlap that much. And so um, for certain things, for example, indoor use, for IT use, for things like uh, laptops, um, Wi-Fi will remain predominant. But anything involving mobility, replacement of old two, uh, older two-way radio systems, and a lot of the operational technology needs, where you have perhaps machinery with very tight uh, uh, tolerances on deterministic timing, that really lends itself to, to 5G. Um, so anyway, I'll, um, at that point, I will leave the slides and we can come back to what I'm discussing there. Uh, but I'd like to really introduce the other panelists now. So hopefully, if I manage to stop this screen sharing, then Mike will be able to uh, load in the other panelists. Uh, yeah. Not sure if that's allowing me to to stop the screen sharing as well as it. Uh, oh, I see. Right, got it. Okay. Uh, so first off, we have uh, Catherine Gull and Mark Stansfield. Catherine Gull is from uh, Three. Uh, Mark Stansfield heads up the uh, West Midlands Five uh, G initiative. We've got Simon Parry from Nokia, uh, and we should have uh, Phil Cotton. Yes, yes, who's now joining us also from Nokia as well. Um, so hopefully all our sound is good. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear us. Uh, we've got video chat. Um, we've got the, the chat panel um, next to us. So if people would like to ask questions, uh, feel free. I'll keep an eye on that as well as um, moderating the discussion. Um, and um, well, I'd like to sort of basically kick off. And uh, actually, I'll start with Catherine. If you'd like to you know, maybe sort of introduce yourself, um, what you're doing around the industrial IoT and 5G and, and what you see happening in the UK. <clears throat> Great, thanks, Dean. So I'm Catherine Gall, and I'm head of business development in three private networks. And I have not been in the business as long as you, Dean. I've been around this business for around six and a half years. Three, on the other hand, have had a private networks business for the last seven years. It was UK Broadband and is now three. And we design, build, operate, and maintain private networks for mission critical applications. At Heathrow, which is one of our customers. We help Heathrow maintain the airport with what they call is the first private network um, at an airport. Um, we also help them move airplanes onto stands. And so we support many of their customers, not passengers, but their Heathrow customers on the airfield. Another one of our customers, and you were talking about ports earlier, Dean, um, is the Port of Felixstowe. And we have deployed a private network there that enable, enables them to run the port, moving containers on and off of vessels, and most importantly, keeping their KPIs of moves per hour. Now, if you've noticed, I really am focused on what the customer needs. So at three, we focused on the application that meets the customer's requirements and then tailoring the network accordingly. And what we're finding it, with the advent of Industry 4.0 is that the requirements for applications, how we fit the network is starting to change. So we've looking at lower latency, 
um, different uplink and downlink configurations and different throughput. And so these changes that are being brought on by 4.0 are really driving what we're looking at. Um, everything from remote control and vehicles um, to, to a large amount of other things. And one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be here is that I think we're going to have a bit of a conversation on how MNOs, 3GPP, hardware manufacturers, et cetera, can all actually be bringing applications to life for, for industry 4.0. That's really interesting. Actually, a quick question from straight off, uh, Catherine. Um, sure. Do those networks, say at Heathrow and Felixstowe, are they isolated private networks or do they link into Three's national network? They are isolated private networks. They are completely ring fenced. Um, they are maintained and have SLAs according to their requirements. They're purpose built just for those, for those applications. Great, thank you. Um, sure. Next, I'd like to ask uh, mm -hmm. Mark, Mark Stansfield, to uh, introduce yourself, please. Thanks, Dean. Hello, everybody. Nice to uh, be involved. Um, I think I'm probably the longest serving in the industry. I'm like a dinosaur of the industry. I've been around from the very beginning, I think, got this one. Uh, so I was very much involved with uh, the merger BT Cell. I've been involved with the board of, of uh, O2 and the creation of that. Uh, very much focused around the commercial side of the business. Um, setting up GIFGAF, uh, which was an innovative community-led uh, operator. Um, but then I'm poached at home gamekeeper that's moved over to the other side of the fence uh, and been very much involved in the innovative DCMS 5G program um, and being able to pull that ecosystem together. Uh, we started with the Worcestershire 5G program, which is we'll come on to that, looking at the uh, Industry 4.0 applications and 5G. Um, and then we also, I'm also sharing the, the uh, West Midlands 5G uh, program, which is the DCMS's biggest program, and that's about the uh, rollout on a much more commercial basis across the combined authority area. So, some really exciting things. I'm my most interested in growing the ecosystem, making it happen, because for me, it's about having the right technology in the right places. And I think probably think the same about this that it will be a jigsaw of solutions, but 5G for me is a solution that meets many of the right needs in the right places, but it's being clear about what they are and what it is. So uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. That sounds good. Uh, Mark, are you seeing a lot of interest from industrial companies in um, private networks? Because you know, I had heard that, that the UK was a little bit slower on the proactivity compared to say Germany. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering if that's now caught up at all. Uh, yes, and I'd say I think all credit to DCMS and the 5G program. There, there was again, I sat on the board today. So when we looked at 5G, we just thought we we're going to be giving away more and investing more. We couldn't see a commercial model. I think what the program has done, what we're seeing is that uh, you're actually showing the MNOs an opportunity for new revenue streams. And I think the manufacturing one is one of the biggest ones, but it's involving mm -hmm. industry bodies and it's commercial. We'll talk about it, commercializing and productizing it. And I think what three are doing again is great in that space. Uh, that is a commercial model that can be taken a lot wider and further. Excellent, thank you. Um, next up, um, Simon, um, I'll, I'll ask you to introduce yourself, please. <coughs> Hello, uh, I'm Simon Perry. I'm the CTO for Nokia's Enterprise Group uh, here in the UK and covering Ireland as well. Um, well my background, uh, um, I've only managed 20 years in the industry. Um, but my focus historically has been on 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 even lower layers on, on fixed line networks. Um, I used to work in research uh, for fiber optics in the the the, the now deceased um, Harlow Labs, um, birthplace of fiber optics, as it's quite pleased to to, to announce. Um, so yes, yeah, so I joined Nokia uh, 11 months ago um, to 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 focus uh, essentially on how to take uh, solutions that were originally intended for service providers and how to use them um, in the enterprise uh, market. So uh, these you know, isolated private networks and, and, and the one for what of industry for so has suddenly uh, landed uh, upon us. Um, Nokia has got a fair experience. Um, we've deployed uh, about 150 um, private networks uh, across Europe, uh, mostly in countries other than the UK. And one of the things you know that we'll come to talk about is, is regulation and, 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 and the, the access to spectrum. 
Um, and certainly in company in, in Germany, uh, especially because of the, the, the dedicated enterprise production, we've done a number of, of, of proof of concepts um, on 4G and coming on to 5G now uh, to try, especially yeah, to, to focus on industry 4.0 applications. <clears throat> Um, we also uh, heavily leverage these sorts and types of technologies for our own purposes. Um, and we have a factory in Northern Finland in, in a town called Aulu, which is held up by the, um, the, the uh, World Trade Organization as a lighthouse of, of Industry 4.0, showing off a, a number of the technologies that people are talking about. Um, and we actually use it for our own production. This is not some demo facility. Um, we are betting our own reputation on on the fact that the technologies actually work yeah that's that's always good to hear when people in the in the telecoms industry use their own tools so I mean, quite often that's not always the case it's not always uh, do as i do but do as i say but it's, it's good to hear that and, and, and phil um if you'd like to to sort of round off our, our panel yep hi everyone can you hear me okay we can. Yep. Um, so yeah, I'm Phil Cottam. Um, and I'm head of sales for industrial private wireless for UK and I within Nokia Enterprise, and that's part of the wider sort of Nokia group. Um, and I work closely with uh, Simon on sort of uh, developing private cellular wireless for the UK. Um, we specialise in working with customers from all sectors of enterprise. That's transport, energy, public sector and manufacturing logistics and also in some areas defense um i think just for those who are unfamiliar with nokia then we kind of have a long history of building mission critical networks for fixed mobile service providers um and we're also one of the leading providers of 5g infrastructure um uh, globally and um, we've been working with enterprise customers across all industrial sectors for many years um, Simon mentioned that we, we're seeing a lot of interest from, from manufacturing and we're doing it ourselves. Um, we've seen a lot of interest from enterprise really wanting to protect themselves from sort of future COVID-19 type events. And they're really keen to get rid of the wires in the factory or store. They, you know, they want to keep it secure and they want to take more control over their net, the way the network's deployed. Um, at the same time, they want to keep it simple. They don't want to employ a team of PhDs in order to operate it. Um, and that's why um, we've developed a private wireless solution that's optimized for plug and play deployment. We can talk about that a little bit more um, later. And it's it's available as a sort of a solution if you uh, if, if required by the um, service provider. Um, so yeah. Um, that's it really um we've done a we've, we've creating a, a partner ecosystem in the uk now uh, simon says we've deployed more than 150 private wireless networks globally and um we've um, done some research re independent research recently and it's uh, the private wireless network we believe the whole uh, market value is somewhere in the region of 16.3 billion us dollars by 2025 which is why Simon and I are here. You're paying for yourself. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully we can be here by the, longer than the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing in, in the work that I'm doing um, is that each country that I look at has a very different um, perspective and focus on private networks or enterprise networks, mm -hmm. partly driven by spectrum policy and what is made available on a localized basis. And so mm -hmm. UK is different to Germany and to Japan, mm -hmm. and the US and France. Uh, and that sort of then drives what is realistic now versus what might be realistic in two or three years time. Um, are you are you all seeing that as well? And, and what does that mean that we, we, we look like in the UK compared to others in terms of how the, these networks get deployed and, and by whom and for what purposes? Well, it's inter interesting, right? We had the ACIA come over, so we have uh, from Germany come over, we had a joint um, conference there. And I think you're absolutely right that some of the, and I'll call it the backbone and the, uh, uh, whether it be spectrum or different ways of actually it's delivered, but the, the really encouraging thing was that sharing uh, at an industry level, the applications 
are very common and that's obvious but important because uh, we need to be in a position where um, it's not the technology for many of the businesses, particularly when you start to go down to the 95% of manufacturers being at the SME level. They're looking for a product in the box that can deploy, that actually can drive that productivity if they're so seeking it to do. Uh, and it's about making sure that the industry bodies are pushing these and understand it. And there is a clear gap between the technology and the manufacturing and the industry uh, perspective. It is how we close that gap is the challenge. So it's how we embed it actually in the ways of doing business. Okay, yeah. I mean, although, although you could say that even within something like industrial, mm -hmm. the spectrum available will sort of skew, could skew the early use cases towards, let's say, replacement of push to talk and voice and two-way radio mm -hmm. to industrial automation to, I don't know, mobile broadband to vehicles or tablets or something. So even at that level, it might be which applications go first, perhaps. Yeah, and I, I think that's true. But also as well, what I'm seeing is once it's actually, once people trial it, so a good example when we were trialing it in Bosch, um, it soon moved from, you know, um, preventative maintenance and using it for augmented reality and testing. People start to say, oh, we can use it for this, we can use it for that. And that, that's where it is actually becomes embedded in the thinking of the business, which is where you want to be. But you are right there. You're limited in what you can do depending on the technology. Um I just want to tell people before we, uh, there's the, if you look at the tab on the on the right on polls there is a, a poll which is what do you see as the most interesting industrial 5G initiatives um, I'm going to do this myself I'm not quite sure whether it's a, a one choice or multiple choice that's no, one you, you only get to choose one um, um, but uh, if you want to do, click on that while we're doing through and I'll have a look at the results uh, in a few minutes um, but can, can, I, to, can I can I echo Mark's point which is um, one of the really interesting things about, about uh, private wireless, private mobile technology in an industrial setting is it's very much a chicken and egg conversation that when you show what it can do, when you show what it feels like, when you show what it thinks, people come up with another use case. Yeah. And the use case drives the technology, the technology drives the use case. Uh, you know, um, you know the, a lot of the current industrial designers of equipment and machinery are designing it with assumptions about the connectivity. Yeah. And as you change the connectivity to make it better, more reliable, higher bandwidth, you actually change what they use it for. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to say that there's a single use case that's driving it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's this very um, iterative process that you start to see uh, people say, oh, you can do this. And, and genuinely, every time I have a conversation, uh, with with a manufacturer with someone, someone in this space they, they find another use case that yeah. i hadn't thought of and there's another use case and, another use, and i'm fully expecting that during this conversation today we'll think of another three well, it, I, it, it's a it's a ridiculously creative opportunity and i think I, what, I, what i'm seeing actually is really interesting i'm seeing is it, it used to be we used to push the technology out as a oh. technology in the, the mobile industry we used to push that and now, yep. as we introduce it, I, I start to see it being demand led. So it's that push pull and people pulling, and that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Catherine, are you seeing the same thing? I mean, if if you've 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 had users in this space for several years, I mean, have have, have what they're expecting has that changed, and what the applications are has that changed? Yes, the expectation of um, we keep bringing on new applications, um, we keep coming up with new ideas ways for them to make money, ways for them to interwork with customers that come on site or their customers that come on site and leave site as an example. Hmm. Um, also, uh, different ways of working. As, as I think both Mark and Simon said, as industry develops, then you look at how the f private network can develop around the industry and enable the things that is, are already happening in industry. As an example, at the Port of Felixstowe, they have, it's it's well known that they've deployed remote control key cranes, both yard, or key cranes and yard cranes. So that is one, they come to us and said, hey, we could use this for this, this, and this. We could use our private network to enable um, the remote control working. Easier to work on um, the key cranes that run up and down, the key crane essentially run up and down the key side. Um, and the yard cranes, they move a lot fa farther 
up and down. So it's there's just applications all over the place. The exciting thing for me is how we marry the the app applications, the manufacturers of these applications, the requirements of the customer, what the 5G network can do today, and what the 5G network should be able to do tomorrow. No, I, I, actually, one of, one of the use cases I, I heard that was surprising was actually more in the medical sector, and that mm -hmm. was um, basically it was um, whilst I don't quite buy the sort of 5G remote surgery hype. I do think there are some use cases for using with any sort of wireless connectivity, and the use case was fewer wires to disinfect and in fact that actually oh. well, the, the business case came worked. down to, to cleaning and, and to infection control and i was like well and that wasn't on the that wasn't on the 5g triangle i'm pretty sure of it so. no it is surprising actually that um that there are use cases that you don't really expect um yeah we've been involved in a port where actually the use case was reduction in insurance claims and that you know so and you think well oh, okay yeah you didn't really expect that you, you expect more of an operational sort of make it work quicker and faster and, and better whereas in fact it was linking up videos with the serial numbers and so you know video analytics and that means any claims the port have is re they can reject and say no it was fine when it left left the port and you think ah <laughs> and we also find that most customers do have one or two anchor use cases that they mm. they sort of they approach us with but um, as soon as you start talking to them yeah they start oh so we can do that as well and we can do that uh, as well and that business case just evolves well we're looking i think you're right, and simon's right about it it's it's iterative but you know a lot of the time at the moment it is within a defined locality many of these applications mm. and uh yeah, across uh, the test bed being Worcestershire five G and West Midlands five G. What we're beginning to look at is across the supply chain. So how do you actually, if you can drive productivity improvements of up to two percent, as we did with Mazak, which is you know significant if you take up to UKPLC, what could you drive across the supply chain? And the challenge, of course, is you've got a bunch of um, mobile people or you know technology people. I'm going to be careful what I say on this one. We don't understand the needs of the of the manufacturers need you actually need people to understand um what what the application opportunities are and as that education goes but i think the there's no doubt there are some significant in the right place productivity gains um for mm. manufacturers and industry quite frankly yeah. catherine i've got a question in that case linking into what mark just said about um specialization and understanding of verticals um in your view can mobile operators understand or hope to understand a large number of industries or do you have to pick and choose you know two three four five and say those are the serious ones and then we'll, we'll use partnerships elsewhere well, how does that work uh you've answered my question <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> um that's the exact answer i think it is using specific industries that we know we know a lot about we can, we're already deep into them and we've got the expertise and then also working with partners. Um, I think some, I think you said in the introduction, there, uh, there are things that are gonna be driven by a provider that actually, um, a provider of an application where, um, you know, they will need for 4G, 5G private network connectivity and we will sit right under that. Um, in other cases, we will say, we will have a relationship they will have an application. In the case of the Port of Felix, though, they had a specific application that they had to implement, and they had a time frame, a budget, etc. And then once they've done that, they said, "Well, we need it here, we need it there," and and that's kind of how it's going to work. So I think we'll we will get intimate in certain applications. We'll be able to do those all day long, and then other things that we will just fit underneath. Thank you. There was a question that's come up about devices, um, mm -hmm. uh, and also that relates into one that I was going to ask about spectrum, um, yeah. and either into what well, the, the 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 specific question was about um, uh, industrial use cases where there are um, explosives issues. I think um, ATEX issues, it said here, which means end user devices are hard to come by. But you, presumably that means you've got to find end user devices which are both suitable to the industry like they're explosive proof or whatever it is yep. plus they support the right spectrum bands i know the uk has some slightly weird choices 
for private networks. So how is that working out? So it, it, they're absolutely right. Uh, finding ATEX devices in the spectrum bands that we have to work with in the UK and also in, in other countries is quite difficult. And I think, again, it's the convergence of all these different um, members of the ecosystem. It's the hardware providers. It's, it's the industry mm -hmm. saying, this is what we need that will actually start to get those devices out. I know it's something that three as a as a global or organization is working together amongst our three operators to provide those so so he's, he's absolutely right yes absolutely it's right. it's, a, it's 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 also that um uh okay we'll get on the subject um when we talk about 5g and we talk about industrial settings um generally there's not a legacy to protect so there's a lot of discussion around that, that maybe we jump past NSA, that we might jump straight to the pure 5G uh, network of a 5G standalone. Mm -hmm. And right now, there are very few 5G standalone device chipsets out there. Yeah. And then, and, and you know, the, the, manuf the chipset manufacturers are talking, you know, the, the, the Q3 this year, samples now, stuff starting to arrive at the end of this, 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 this calendar year. And and so so you know, traditionally, the networks have been led by consumer devices, and then industrial devices tend to come along eighteen months later as the ecosystem develops. That's what we've seen in three G, as we've seen in four G. I'm expecting, and from what we're seeing, there's actually going to be an inverse, and it's going to flip. The industrial SA devices look like they're coming first. That for precisely all the reasons we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 these are, especially with isolated networks, you might as well jump straight to SA that there's because mm -hmm. you haven't got a legacy network to, to, to feel like you're, you've got to sweat the investment. A, 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 quick, a quick word for people on the call who may, not, who may be not familiar with the, the, the types of 5G. Um, there's multiple generations of 5G networks. Um, the first versions use the existing 4G network core, which is why they're being used for things like mobile phones and consumers today. But the really interesting stuff with 5G happens with what's called standalone, where you don't rely on the 4G network. You have a self-contained 5G network. So it's just put it, and they, it is rather <coughs> confusingly called standalone and non-standalone. Uh, and I'd recommend people have a, have a quick look up on on online right after names. this off this call yeah, yeah yeah and you get into private networks and so public networks and non-public networks and all kinds yeah. of, they, 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 they're very much named by engineers and we're sorry um, <laughs> and we apologize for, for, for we love a good acronym especially if you get to four and five letters then, then that, that because it, but that's the point <laughs> devices um so as Catherine was saying, you know, we're all hunting for devices. Uh, Nokia is looking through its supply chain and its partners, and can we bring uh, devices for the UK spectral bands, especially standalone devices? Mm -hmm. Because that seems to where all the mm -hmm. uh, hyped benefits of 5G start yeah. to meet with reality and start to to to, to come through is 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 in the world of of of, of standalone. So. Um, Yes, and, and ATEX devices, we can see some um, on the horizon. We can see some for, for, for UK applications. But yeah, we'll see industrial first, it looks like, for SA. Thank you. Mark, Mark what, what are you finding in terms of the, the projects you're looking after? Are, are, what's happening on devices? Is anyone using the UK's 3.8 to 4.2 gigahertz band? What, what, what else is going on? What, well, don't forget, when we started out, it was so nascent. We were actually using R&D kit even at the network, and it was you know, challenging at the best of times because we were having to uh, work very closely to actually make sure we got the right um, performance of the network. And uh, so it is challenging, but the CP in getting hold of the kit is one of the biggest problems that we've been facing uh, in the applications. And we've tried a number of different ones without naming. Some have performed particularly well, all right, and good. Other ones, less so. Uh, but it is, uh, I think Simon's exactly right that we're in a position where uh, you've got the different parts of the ecosystem catching up with each other and it's ebbing and flowing, quite frankly. So as we move from NSA to our staff alone and also the business cases come out of it, then people are beginning to say, hold on a minute, this is actually worth in investing in. And I do think Simon's absolutely right. I'm seeing a transition because people can see more money in the enterprise space mm -hmm. and say, well, I would actually invest in that because there's some some real value. 
I think <laughs> se September this year appears to be a, um, a point where these things start to sort of be become all together. Yeah. You know, the, the 5G standalone, sort of the end devices, the radio, it all seems to come in, in around September this year. That's that. I think that's that's the kind of the 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 kickoff point we're seeing. Um, I'd like to um, move on a bit um, to talk about the role of different organisations in this, and particularly the role of mobile network operators and perhaps fixed network operators. You know, Catherine, obviously you're working from for a division of three, but you're doing wholly private networks rather than the usual sort of vision the mobile industry says of we'll build a big national network and we'll give a slice for this enterprise and a slice for that enterprise you're taking it much more as a sort of a almost a systems integrator or specialist network provider role is that way where you see other mnos going and i'll, I'll open that to, to everyone else as well or what's 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 the, the sweet spot here i i can't really speak for other mnos um I think one of the things that drives the way that we behave is our spectrum portfolio and our philosophy from the outset. And we are open to deploying in our spectrum or we're open to deploying in the private uh, or the shared license spectrum, both of them. We um, actually own spectrum. We own a ton of spectrums that we we actually have the gift of being able to do a lot of different things with our own spectrum. That that's one of the reasons why um, slicing it will be something that we'll consider doing in different places. But right now we're focused really on the private networks. Thank you, and, and Simon and and, and uh, Phil. I know Nokia. Obviously, you work directly with enterprises and you work with operators. Are you seeing any patterns emerge? Uh, we're seeing, certainly seeing, uh, as Catherine is saying there, um, all the operators willing to use the shared spectrum. So we've got conversations um, with all that. And that's for, for a number of reasons, um, because it isolates away from their own um, spectrum, but also because the end customer likes the idea of having um, a separate spectrum, but likes the idea even more to, to still want to work with an operator, because operators, that's what they do for a living. And so there is this... This is quite a nice sweet spot. Um, mm. I think we're finding that quite a, um, quite a lot. Yeah, so there's definitely a pattern there. It's something that I certainly didn't envisage at the start. I thought there could be sort of a, a conflict, but no, actually, I think it's taken a while for some operators to get round to it. But they're now, I think it's it's a viable uh, opportunity now. Simon, do uh, you have anything to add to that? Um, I think, you know, it, it's... Um, Deploying a cellular network is similar but different to deploying other radio networks, and there is things. And the MNOs have a particular depth of talent, have particular skills, have a particular experience, you know, that stuff. But in the same way, there are partners and there are system integrators who are also in, in that space. So it's 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 a kind of horses and courses moment that, that, mm -hmm. that, that there are things and, and applications and use cases that the MNOs have unique talents um, in terms of being able to de deploy, especially when it connects the wider network and the public network and you, and you need the, mm -hmm. the distance and support if you're using strange frequencies. But there are also times when you want control and you may work with an SI or even build it yourself. So we're mm -hmm. seeing, you know, Oh, a huge variety of, of as, as, as we talked about the multiplicity of use cases that drives a, a bunch of different routes to the market mm -hmm. um, and that no one is better than the other in any particular use case. I think it's based around my experiences and being in the operators is it's about skill set and um, no Simon's absolutely right there's no one not no one person that is going to own that initial relationship or with the customer you know the operators it's a skill to actually understand a sector and you cannot understand all sectors. And that's why there's a role for SIs, there is a role for multitude, because that's what distribution, balanced distribution is about. Um, but, you know, the operators, it's recognizing where they want to be and who they partner with and not compete against, although there will be much more competition in, as it should be in any competitive market. Mm -hmm. But um, ultimately, is you may be working on a frenemy basis where you might be competing some business, but ultimately somebody else wins it. But you still have a part to play in that. Mm -hmm. It is. It, 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 it's. It's not about single ownership. This. 
I mean, because I'm seeing in some parts of the world, there are operators who are really going after the sort of um, what they're calling campus network yeah. opportunity mm -hmm. where they want to be the lead players on this. I'm thinking particularly Germany, Austria, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, I, I, I suspect we may end up with other places where operators act as almost more the sort of outsourcing or systems integration players or perhaps do thin slices of, yeah. I don't know, you know, multi-tenant core network as a service, SIM mm -hmm. management as a service, um, roaming and interconnect, I don't know, voice, um, oh yeah, enterprise voice as a service, and, and sort of pick out those those horizontals. And the, mm -hmm. and the challenge, and challenge, Dean, on that one is that many operators don't want to be the utility, the commodity basis, so it's where the, everybody will be competing where the value lies. Mm -hmm. And I guess okay. that's the IP stuff. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is the parallel I would draw is perhaps with with PBXs from thirty years ago or twenty thirty. Yeah, tel telcos thirty years ago all wanted to own the the sort of cool control for enterprise. Enterprise mm -hmm. like, well, actually, we want to have our own private network. And what actually happened was most telcos either installed or certainly fixed telcos installed, sold, maintained PBXs from mm -hmm. you know, Lucent or uh, Via now or whoever or, or, or Ericsson or anyone else. Um, and then sold um, the trunk lines and yeah you know, and so on and they actually made good business out of the, the sort of those piece parts mm -hmm. even though they didn't do everything on it no it's they put it all in centrex and hosted telephony the hard the hard thing is for a business invariably they're looking for a one-stop solution and they want to go to somebody who can help them across the, the, the breadth of the business the challenge with many operators is they don't have that skill set which is why the role of an si joining not only the activity, but some of the other points is such a fundamental part. So it's going to be a really interesting space over the next few years. Mark, I know, you, I, know, I know you've got about 10, five, 10 minutes before you drop off. So I'm just having a look through the list of questions and seeing if there's anything that's uh, um, uh, specific to you. Um, one question a couple of people have asked has been around security mm -hmm. and private networks. I don't know if you or anyone else has observations on that. Uh, so from from our side, security is, of course, it's always imp important. And you know, if I go back to the basic insight of many of the manufacturers we've been talking to, is what they're looking for is they're looking for a stamp of assurance that what they've got is a secure network and it meets all the requirements they want. So there is a an assurance product, and there is, I think, it was Phil who went and said there is a a plug and play product that uh, a SME could actually execute into its business and then they're up and running. They just don't want the complexity taken away from them. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you depends on what level of security you're after that that, that that you know we have a number of conversations going on with with defense manufacturers and, and also the the, the, the the armed forces who are looking to some of these technologies. You know, for example, um there's a conversation going on around around disaster relief that that, that when um a large natural disaster happens you know the first people on the scene are usually the navy or the marines or one of one of the the the, the, the four. and how alongside comes all the emergency services you've got the red cross you've got the un and none of them can talk to each other but if you use a lot of these sorts of technologies where you hand out a, essentially a bunch of sim cards to everyone stick it in your phone and off we go so 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 there's there's some you know yeah, but that has to be very secure to, mm -hmm. to operate in those sorts of environments mm -hmm. um you know aerospace is another one where where, where people are uh, justifiably concerned about about people trying to steal their mm -hmm. stuff so you know that's where these you know it's catherine was talking about these, these in fact ports as well as you mentioned catherine have, have got you know pretty serious security requirements that mm -hmm. a lot of people would like to get their hands on the manifest of what's going through ports Mm -hmm. uh, Maersk, you know, was f fell victim to one of the biggest cyber attacks in in in, in history. Mm -hmm. So, so um, yeah, security is is central to everything mm -hmm. we do, and and it is one of the massive benefits of using uh, mobile phone technology. Is is that the SIM card, you know, is is it's not unhackable, but it's, it it provides you with a really solid physical piece of security. Um, for operating these networks yeah. on top of 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 all the application level security and everything mm -hmm. run over the top so so you know we see an, a lot of requirements where, where security is the driver for these sorts of networks mm. and i think um, just just the fact that you've got licensed spectrum oh sorry 
Sorry, Mark, you've got to go. I've got to go. So I wanted to thank you and thank everybody for it. And uh, I hope I see the panel soon and many of the people in the audience. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, thank you very much, Mark. Thanks. Cheers. Yeah, I was, ju I was just going to compliment that what Simon was saying is that just the fact that with a private network, if you're using licensed spectrum, that in itself gives affords you a level of security that you're probably not considering. So that's designed in security because if you've got a problem with someone trying to, you know, pitch up on your site, then you've got Ofcom behind you. So you've got that level of assur you know, security that you wouldn't have if you're trying to set up something with Wi-Fi, for example. So that puts you on a different plane, a different level of security straight away. Does that apply where you're going to have um, cellular networks in unlicensed spectrum as well? Well, no, unlicensed is unlicensed. Yeah. yeah. So but there's, 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 again, well, but you, but you're still you're still authenticating with a SIM or an eSIM. Yeah. That, that, that there's 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 you know which is. Yeah. Um, what's the well, word? at least in 4G, but not in, in 5G. There's a, a non-SIM app uh, uh, option, isn't there? If unlicensed. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, and yeah. So there are various. Yeah. So there's different there's different layers of it, isn't there? And that some of it may not be so obvious. And, and, you, and you know, there, there's there's things like you know, if you're operating a really weird piece of spectrum. Hmm. Um, you know, the, the, the one one of the joys is is that there's no devices available. You know, it means that it, you know it's it's, it's 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 kind of security by obscurity by the fact that there's just nothing with an RF stage that can connect to. Mm. Um, That's true. <laughs> well, on that topic, so the UK we have this now 3.8 to 4.2 gigahertz band um, yep. for local um, local licensing. Is anyone is anyone doing anything with it yet? Yes. Well, so, 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 so Dean, you have to remember that the that three of have, have, have had also UK broadband have had had a license for part of that band for a while now. So, so, yep. so, so oh, did it go out that high? Oh, okay, I didn't yeah. yeah. Sorry, Catherine, I'm just starting to think. That's all right. Here. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the reality is is um, that the 3.8 to 4.2, sometimes known as it's part of N77, um, has been really obscure. Uh, is, is that 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 so far, only Japan has deployed it. Um, the UK's had it, but it's never been a big enough. It's back to the chicken and egg. Is mm -hmm. is that without enough applications, no one's going to build anything from it, and it all goes gets stuck. Although so, with USC band licensing coming up, that might change. So you got US and um, Belgium's looking at it, um, and there's a consultation out in Belgium for that band. Uh, and there's a couple of other European countries are, are looking at it uh, based and they're looking to see what happens in the UK. So, so um, you know, it's been a challenge that yeah. the, the, the ecosystem is, is not, and as Phil said, you know, and, and because that 3.8, 4.2 is seen as a 5G band, it doesn't have to be 5G, yeah. but, but the perception and, and the momentum is that it's 5G. So it's that, Back where I was saying, Alex, that waiting for SA, it's that waiting for, for you know do you, things that that's held up, and we're really seeing that that that's uh, a positive tidal wave of conversations going on um, yeah. a, around all kinds of applications from industrial and indoor. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Ofcom deliberately set it up for it to be a fixed wireless access band as well, and there's a, you know, a number of people looking at using it. For, for mm. rural coverage, especially yeah. um, in the world of fixed wireless access, yeah. for sm very small areas. So the, the number of applications is exploding. So, so um, I, I, I apologize to people who aren't as much of a spectrum geek as perhaps some of yeah. us are, but um, the other thing that's likely to be coming up, certainly in the US, probably in the UK and across Europe, is unlicensed six gigahertz. Mm -hmm. And so do you see the sort of balance of attention going to unlicensed six gig or licensed 3.8 to 4.2 or both all of the above <laughs> no, i was going to say it, it's, it, it, it is, really depends on the applications yeah. the, the requ customer requirements where they're located you know let's yeah. look at uk example we, we, we you know we are we're still the home of motorsport and and, and and the Formula One teams and the things want a solution that they can take with them around the world and do private wireless on tour. Um, oh, boom, boom, oh, boom. Yeah. 
At which point the 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 the, the five point eight six gigahertz stuff that's unlicensed is brilliant because it works in so many countries with one piece of hardware. Yeah. That's one set of applications and you know one use case for that. On the flip side, if you want to secure back to security, you don't want to be operating in, in unlicensed spectrum. So it's 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 you know uh, what's the word? It's like with um you know just th this conversation, you know, five years ago, we couldn't do this because yeah. the technology was not available. People's home broadband was just not up to being able to do, you know, what, what's that? 100, 200 people with five presenters on a video call just didn't work. We kind of invented it because the bandwidth was there. If you give people bandwidth, they will think things to do with it. Mm. Yeah. Um, and we're yeah. seeing lots of interesting things that people want to do with it as well. Yeah, no, and I, 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 frankly, even I'm seeing even where people there's just a small amount of spectrum, say sub one gigahertz. There's all sorts of interesting IoT managed service business models. Yep. Uh, I saw mm. someone in the US is looking at twelve gigahertz or something. Oh, I never, you know, I'm sure they'll work out. Uh, I, I want to move on from spectrum though. Um, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can talk. We can talk <laughs> afterwards. Um, yeah, um, one of the questions that's come up a couple of times is around um, the private isolated networks and how the relationship with the macro networks for MNOs and whether we're going to see some form of interconnection, whether it's roaming, whether it's some sort of mobility, or whether everyone's just going to say, you know what, just keep it two separate worlds. And for the odd vehicle or, or phone, actually, we'll have a dual SIM phone and they can just switch between it manually. What, don't worry about it. What's 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 the the practical side of this? Are, are we going to see this sort of hybrid, private, public network, or is it going to be a set of clunkier ways of gluing stuff together? I think it's more of a private, friendly network rather than private public, because the people who will be roaming onto your private network are people you know, or entities. No. So anything from an airplane landing at Heathrow and it is land is at Heathrow maybe once a month, once a week, and it's known. So that will come on. You know, take an example of FedEx. Hmm. FedEx FedEx may have land at networks, private networks, and they're trying to um, manage the health of an animal that's on their airplane, let's say. And as it lands it's got a SIM that says, oh, yes, I can interwork with the Heathrow private network. Here's how the animal is doing. Here are the animal statistics. Goes up into a cloud somewhere and someone sees, oh, yes, that baboon is fine. And then um, it takes off and it lands at Charles de Gaulle that also has a private network. Does I'm, I'm, I'm stealing the baboon use case for private 5G, by the way. Well, wasn't 4G all about the connected cow? And it kept coming up over and over and over again. Um, but to yeah, echo Catherine's point, is, is, is for each of those deployments of, you know, is it purely private? Is it some kind of hybrid? Is it dual SIM? Is it things? You can find it half a dozen use cases. You can find a bunch of applications and people will run with it. So, so it, it, it's so stupidly open-ended at the moment in terms of all the possible things you can do. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the really big question is who controls the SIM? Because the SIM has to authenticate against one authentication server. Hmm. Yep. And and if and that's the real crux of the matter, is is if you if the enterprise, if the industry can if the, the industrial purposes is controls the SIM then it's a very straightforward private network, very isolated and mm -hmm. very difficult to connect to the public network. Yep. If the MNO controls the SIM, then many things become possible, but you're then in a whole world of complexity and interworking gateways and things. So it, that's, mm. that's, the re, that's the technical crux that, that answers a lot of the business decisions about hybrid is it semi-public? Is it truly public? Is it is, yeah. is, is is that fair, Catherine? Yeah, I think so. I think I think it's all doable. Yes. With the right amount of money, technology, it's all doable. It's just hmm. Is that impacting my private network, and do I want? Do I not want that? Although it may, maybe I do. Maybe it gives 
Absolutely. income, whatever it is. So there's, I think it's a balance. Yeah, I, I, I mean, for me, one of the differences between industrial facilities and let's say consumer facilities, maybe like the passenger terminal at the airport mm -hmm. or a hotel or a venue is you've got a bit more control over who's there, what devices they've got, and there's usually a business interest in, in, in if, if, if not using a specific sim, then you've got a bit more a bit more leverage. Whereas the use cases of if I walk into a hotel somewhere, I'm not going to sort of say, well, I use Vodafone, so I'm going to stay at Hilton rather than Mario. It, it would make no sense at all. Um, and the same thing in, in the future, the paradox is that people are going to be coming onto the sites and they will be in a connected car which has who knows what sim, or I've got a drill or a tool or something, or a VR headset. I mean, the, 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 I, my, my sort of um, uh, straw man argument for a lot of this is, imagine um, some an elevator engineer comes on site with a VR headset and has to be inside the elevator shaft to mm -hmm. fix the fix the lift. And you, first, you don't know if there's coverage. Secondly, he, he or she's got no idea what, what sim, if any, is in the, the headset. And at that point, you just give up and sort of put an SD card full of the blueprints on, on the on the thing. I don't know, but it's yeah. It's, and it, if you want, you know, and you can take it even further that that that, that you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we've been trying to steer around the word COVID nineteen, but um, mm -hmm. if you look at retail, I'll retail is, is, yeah. is going to be completely transformed in the next few years. That you've got, you know, Amazon looking at doing no touch stores. This idea that you could walk in and pick something up. But a lot of those sorts of technologies rely on the members of the public being having connectivity yeah. in places that are typically badly served today. That if, oh. if, you, if to check out, you have to have mobile signal, that's going to, you know, so, so as on mm. the flip side of private networks, you've also again got neutral hosts and how do you extend the public network into private spaces is the other side of the bubble. Not what we're supposed to be talking mm. about today, but they're a yin and a yang of, 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 of solutions. Well, I've, I've run workshops and, and advise clients on neutral hosts, so it's, it's a subject dear to my heart at the moment. But uh, yeah, and then I suppose the, then the question is actually, I'll, I'll find this at Catherine. So if there's a uh, oh, sorry about this but if there's a facility which is um has a neutral host um mm -hmm. would you but one of your existing clients let's say the port and there's a, a warehouse nearby which has its own network yeah would you sort of as three business uh, uh, negotiate with the neutral host in that warehouse to roam onto it so that your existing client could get continuity Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there are many, many scenarios where there are ports and logistics warehouses next door. And that makes total sense. And it may be that that warehouse also wants to. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I see. Why not? I think there's going to be some interesting models here around local roaming, also local data interconnect as well. One, one of the mm -hmm. other things I'm thinking about mm -hmm. at the moment is edge computing, edge interconnect, and federation, uh, and so on. I'm, I'm having a look through the, the other questions. Actually, the one which which does come up a few times in the, in the questions is around uh, the pandemic and COVID-19, either in terms of the specifics around you know, industrial IoT and private networks, or more generally about 5G. Um, Anyone have any views on on what's going to happen on the short term or long term? Uh, yeah, given give given where we are, well, we're seeing a, we're seeing a lot of interest from manufacturers, customers looking at taking more control, wanting to be better prepared. Um, so, like for example, Simon mentioned that the factory in Finland that is 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 connected. And what we're able to do there, um, and, I, and, I don't, and I think it was a, for a short term, but we could actually get these little mini robots going around the production line. So it was almost like a dark factory. So and the people were from home and they could actually then with the camera on top of the, sort of the, little, the little robot go around the production lines. So yeah. and that kind of gives that little bit of flexibility. You remove the person out, whether that's permanently or short term, but it allows you to continue business. And so that's what we're, we're seeing a lot of interest in that kind of what if thinking. Mm. I've heard it referred to as moving from just in time to just in case. Mm. Which I, oh, yeah. Seems reasonable, yeah. 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 So the other thing is um, CNBC was talking about travel and how 
um, private networks and the advent of 5G were going to allow um, the reduction of travel to continue, not just beyond beyond the COVID time. Mm. Essentially, what they were saying is, whereas you would send someone from, I'm using the airport again, you would send someone from Seattle, let's say, that had to fix a specific problem with an airplane somewhere. And now what you'll do, that guy will stay in Seattle. There'll be AR, VR at that site. There'll be one person there, not two. There'll be someone on site. That person there on site will may not necessarily be the expert. The expert will be in Seattle and he will be saying, do this, do that, do this, do that. Um, so, so Catherine. Yes. Uh, we're already doing it. Yes, so, I figured. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so, so the, the public one is um, Lufthansa, so Lufthansa Technik, oh, yeah. which, which is um, in Hamburg. Um, they have a maintenance hangar, and and they've been they're actually doing it pre-COVID because the cost of flying experts in when you have an aircraft that's down, you know, the 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 the, 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 the cost of it being out of service is so high yeah. that you you are willing to spend a lot of money on connectivity to fix it quicker. Yeah. Fantastic. And I think, yeah. yeah. I did a reason for it because it had two hangers next to each other. Yeah. One with which was using um, uh, using it for remote inspection of engine parts under maintenance. Mm. I seem to believe, yeah. and the other one was for fitting out new planes interior, essentially doing interior design with VR. Yeah. And they had slightly different approaches to doing each one. And 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 the reason for using five G was that mobile technology is really good at dealing with reflections with big metal things in a way that wi-fi just doesn't work so so it's the physics it's the way that they were designed as radio protocols to work in the wider environment accidentally means they are brilliant at working inside aircraft hangars that wasn't yeah. the design but it turns out that that 4g and 5g and and you just need the bandwidth to do these high definition either video or augmented reality or virtual reality applications. Yep. That was a, a POC and that was done back going back, that was an NSA deployment because that was all that was available in terms of hardware at the time. You can, yeah, we're ripping it out as soon as we can and going straight to SA. But these kind of remote worker, remote experts, remote driving. So we've now yeah. got people using this sort of technology to drive trucks in mines where you don't want the people there because they're exposed to noxious gases you know they're, they're, they're. so i think the point of the pandemic in this conversation is it's bringing forward a lot of the ideas that people were beginning to think about so it's accelerating the change not creating yes. the change i totally agree there yeah, I, think and I, th well, I, don't, I don't think I'm the first to point this out. I think there's various commentators. Yeah, are, no, whereas I don't think I was really surprised that CNBC would actually cite that as a reason for travel going down, business travel going down. Yeah. Your post pandemic. Yeah, because it was kind of beginning. Mm. Yeah. You know, we're, we're deploying private, you know, we deployed our first private network without going there. This idea that even, you know, a technician going to the site, you know, we actually have deployed one two weeks ago without um, anyone going, you know, the, 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 just the locals. So yeah, it's accelerating the number of trends. Is that, you know, remote expert, remote worker, but also um, instrumentation, the whole of industry 4.0, collecting numbers, can we be more efficient? Can we drive the productivity higher? These are all questions that people are either so busy that they need a problem fixing now, or they've got time to 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 examine and, and and try and come up you know to to, to move it forward so yeah it is a real and the COVID situation is is horrible and it's it's given us as Simon said it's given us time to look at things and also challenges that businesses industry thought they would never have such as um, social distancing now, how do I handle my shop floor now and mm. looking at the applications that are being put forward on industry Ford Auto that will be driving kind of our post or our COVID mm. world. Instead of yeah. having a full shop floor, we're looking at, someone was saying they were looking at 800 people and now that they have to do 200. So yeah. how do you make up that productivity difference? And that's uh, I mean, private I mean, networks, industry mm. for 
I think there's a number of things. Actually, on that last point, um, I, I, I've been looking into things like smart buildings, perhaps more on the office space rather than on industrial, but whether you can use wireless networks to um, monitor and track uh, either flow through a building, um, have lower densities in certain areas. And then uh, my suspicion is that if we come back in two or three years' time, we're probably going to find building regulations that are maybe not permanently, it depends on what happens to the vaccine, but where a government can essentially flip on an emergency pandemic switch and say, right, your 800 capacity building has gone to 200. Either you are pandemic certified grade A, which case do that, <laughs> or you're closed. And I think mm -hmm. that, that what we'll get is some ways of doing, and there's multiple ways of doing this. You can, I mean, there's people already using uh, partly Wi-Fi, but actually of, of, all, of all the technologies, Bluetooth low energy mm -hmm. is the one which mm -hmm. is being used for um, beacons and sensors of, yeah. of people in a, in a room. Um, and then you can put that onto a floor plan and use that to essentially work out how you implement a one-way system in the building. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps you have dynamic signage, so your conference room, it, it goes maximum occupancy 100 to 30. God knows, and it probably, mm -hmm. have, actually the big problem actually is elevators. Um, mm -hmm. And how you go from a 12-person elevator to a two-person ele elevator and whether you need to sort of book a slot for it or something. We'll all but... become a lot fitter, won't we? <laughs> Or in the case of the smokers, they will stop smoking. <laughs> well, but there's a, there is a genuine problem, especially you know central London, of, of you cannot get that many people physically back into the building because of the elevators. And, and if you're doing any form of social distancing, it's 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 a it's a massive. It is the bottleneck completely and utterly. Um, yeah, so there's lots of companies running around trying to uh, use Bluetooth low energy to solve distancing. So that there's a number of ones that are some kind of wearable device that, that, that sets alarms off if you get too too close to other people. Um, uh, you know, wristbands, we've seen thick belt mounted things, there's all kinds of technology because you can, but if you then can centralize that data and suck it up, you can prove to the health and safety executive that you've kept your workers safe and that needs connectivity and it needs connectivity in strange places. Oh, look, we've just reinvented private wireless networks again. Um, so, 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 yeah, but yeah. is that going to be just transient? phenomenon that for the next few months until things settle down or will that become the new normal i'm not i, I always worry slightly that we're bandwagon yeah. jumping uh, and there's also going to be 101 smart building companies say oh we've got an optical sensor that can count people yeah. another group is are we using ultrasonics and then there's going to be yeah you know, it's the sort of thing which is going to be fascinating but we're going to end up with 17 different solutions of most of which none of us know about because we don't know smart building sensors inside out the way that uh, someone who does this day in day out. and yeah you know, I, I thought about someone who recently they're doing smart windows that can try and count people inside the room and things like this mm. wow. it, it is amazing how many technologies are chasing a problem mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, sign of creativity the sign of great wondrousness kind of who's going to pay for it who, who, how it's actually all going to work, and we will, we will have to throw it away in three years. So, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I'm trying to skim read the questions as well. There's all kinds yeah. of uh, uh, private conversations going on around there. Yes, right, and it, and it looks like uh, I've, got, I've just said uh, um, Nigel's just said uh, ten more minutes we can run if we can pull in some more questions. Right, see, see from the event chat. So uh, I've, I've been trying to go through some of the questions, but um, I'll, I'll have a flick through um, and see what else we've got. Um, <laughs> questions here yeah i think it's a lot of it a lot of the comments on, on there's a really good conversations here um but a lot of it is people discussing with themselves um uh, so, so so you know one thing we we touched on it slightly earlier is 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 about guarantees and can you bet on these networks mm. um and 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 you know it's one of the joys about license spectrum is it's yours whether it's mno license spectrum or shared access and so you control every device on it, which means that you can control what's there and therefore write quality guarantees. Add yeah. that to making, you know, in the technology, there's this idea of cores that you can push to local sites to keep the traffic local. 
and suddenly you're down into millisecond latency um even with 4g as well as with 5g yeah. that you've got this very high reliability because you're be you know which you need to bet your business you know we're betting our factory on the fact that this exactly. technology works you know if you know it, there's a lot of money at stake here um exactly. and, yeah. and so so you know this is not consumer grade technology this is not th this is stuff that if you've got to write an sla underneath it and there's penalties for it you can rely uh, on the technology and it does scale really quite impressively sorry catherine i, I suspect that you do it's just no i totally agree with you there i totally agree and i think again it's it's how the network is built according to the app the required application so you can actually say this is the application this is the throughput you need this is the latency you need and you build the network that way and the uptime that you need and so you you, you build it you know build it so you can uh take a uh, take a um a base station out and still run you know no yeah. difference at all. um uh, and that's 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 that it gets particularly important if you'd start you're doing millimeter wave uh indoors which i've seen a couple of people talking about but that's maybe a discussion for another time uh, one question which which did crop up which is around billing and monetization Catherine, for, for places like airports or ports where you've yep. got almost a landlord landlord model where you've got other companies as part of that, you see, you might have the airport and then you've got the catering companies and the airlines. Yeah. Do they end up looking like mini MNOs? Do they have their own billing system or do you run it for them? Or how does that work? It depends on the application or it depends on the customer, but um, we help the, them bill essentially, depending on mm -hmm. how is structured is one off and a monthly fee that's easy then the um, the entity can bill it or if it's based on um, CDRs then we will bill it and we will help help the entity with that uh, Simon and Phil are you seeing any, any interest on the sort of BSS side for private networks or, or is that way out uh, ooh, uh, in what sense? BSS well, side? Uh, uh, well, do, do companies deploying um, private networks want to sort of build their internal users and departments? And yeah, it, oh, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. So we, we, we are working with a couple of cu customers who would like to, if you like, they, they'd like to have a private wireless network as a service from either an operator for an SI, but they would like to become a virtual private network operators where they would then like to take, yeah, they would like to take the SIM cards and then distribute them around and charge internally for, 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 for those use. So they don't want to be the operator, but they want to be the, the virtual operator um, yeah. and, and, in control, yeah. And, and being as these are typically data networks, the, the tariffing is not minutes. And and, oh, yeah. and, the, yeah. and it's generally not even megabytes. Is it? Is it? You know, it's some. You know, it's usually per sim. So it, it's not a heavyweight billing system. But but you know, because otherwise you end up with the billing system costing more than you make. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's it's is is it's you know you have to. But certainly, cross charging or becoming a a, a lightweight virtual operator is is very much. You know what what were the aspirations of, of some of the people looking to operate these networks mm. yeah and i imagine with eSIM it gets easier as well although what i really don't want to have is the the cellular equivalent of wi-fi splash pages which is sign on with your facebook id or give us your email address <laughs> on a captive port a captive port oh. yeah. yeah someone's <laughs> going to drop back you know if we do. yeah uh, so you, you know someone's going to do you it, know though. you know someone's thinking about it yeah um Oh, well, hopefully I'll spike their patent application. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we've got a, not a name exclusive in public. That's right. <laughs> um, uh, I've got a, um, uh, te a very technical question at the moment, um, which I guess some is for you. It says, uh, will private networks in 3.842 or 3.7 in Germany need to be TDD synchronized with MNO networks in neighboring channels? Um, there's a very, so, so, so Ofcom have been having a good hard think about this. And there's an excellent section. If you look at the Ofcom stuff about shared access um, and the documentation, about they, they talk about this at great length. Essentially, maybe, 
is the answer is <laughs> is is um if you're deploying inside if you're deploying you know in a way that your radiation is not going to leak out, out of things then you can be clocked to whatever you like as you get closer you get to work in an adjacent band yes you will need to be synchronized with the, with the with the wider network it's not hard you know it's it's a relatively straightforward thing to to, to synchronize um to these levels um what's actually more of a challenge and going to be a challenge going forward is the fact you have to synchronize frame structure um at the moment mo most public networks have three times the down link as uplink it's this three to one ratio is how most people have deployed 5g mm -hmm. to date and you have to synchronize with it with the frame structure of the mno which because some of the industrial, you want to change the time slot so you can get mm. more uplink, so you can get a more symmetric network. We're seeing a lot of people, you know, we talked at the video, you want heavy uplink, which yeah. means you need a different ratio of time slots. And that's a whole area that we're only really as an industry beginning to try and figure out as to what the interference is, even if you've synchronized the network between uh, different allocations of up and down um, in adjacent networks. Ofcom have parked that for future study. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, presumably the other one that is, is it's not even clear what indoors means i mean if i've got an airport hangar with one open side is that indoor or an outdoor network i'd say it's outdoor uh there, there's about 15 <laughs> pages of definition <laughs> i think an out an outdoor uh, macro could probably cover oh yeah oh yeah quite quite uh, but... that wouldn't be indoors to me so yeah. we we work with a couple of warehouses that are pretty much open all the time and that they're mostly served by outdoors hmm. interesting so yeah no. all of the above yeah okay um we've got a couple of minutes left um actually one thing we haven't talked about is um voice very much and i know we talk about it, very tempting to talk about industrial iot but there's also sort of mission critical push to talk and also yeah. you know private vaulting i know quite a few people in the uk were getting excited about the 2.3 gigahertz i think it's a 10 meg um mm -hmm. license because most mobile phones already support that so you can use yeah. that for a private you know office network for to and run a private ims or something are you seeing any of that or is that hypothetical so so We've been having long chats with Ofcom. At the moment, that license is indoors only. Mm -hmm. the, 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 and, and their concern is that uh, it was left as a guard band because it sits between some spectrum that Telefonica O2 have and the um, what's that, the unlicensed ISM bands they use for Wi Fi and everything else. And they're not worried about digital stuff. What they're really worried about is the old analog um, things like assisted voice. Like in schools where you speak and, and it provides uh, people with hearing difficulties, and a lot of these those old analog systems are really vulnerable to terminals uh, transmitting digitally. And and you, we all remember the GSM interference that you got on, on everything. So they're very worried about that, which is why they're only permitting indoor licenses at the moment, um, because they're worried about the high power and and and, and what that would cause. So in certain positions and locations, it looks quite interesting. So maybe in the future, outdoor licenses, but at the moment, it's indoors only. Right, getting back to your question, voice. We have a lot of solutions out there in terms of technologies for push to talk. There's the 3GPP stuff. Um, mm. There's very proprietary technologies. There's SIP and VoIP and all kinds of apps on phones. We talked a little bit about ATACs. That you can get an ATAX handset that has a button on the side, you press it, it looks like a push to talk radio, but it's actually a VoIP solution. There, there's a whole plethora of technologies out there. Nokia has solutions, other people have solutions, lots of people have. There are horses for courses, there are ways of solving the problem. Um, yeah. It is a well understood one. The one thing it doesn't give you is a mobile phone number. For that, you need an MO. Yeah. Me. <laughs> um, we've been playing around with that for a while. Um, we played with a proprietary system about three, four years ago. It, it's very compelling, especially for places like airports and ports. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, do you let everyone have a mobile SIM, mobile number? Is that the purpose of this? Um, can it just connect to your um, phone system that you have and calls can be made in and out? there, etc.
<laughs> yeah, there's a whole whole set yeah. of questions. Yeah, num num numbering resources is an interesting one. I, I, yeah. I got asked to speak at a um, uh, a industry group on future numbering issues um, for whether there's enough mobile network codes um, if private networks start asking to get MNC codes um, to to generate numbers, and um, that's uh, uh, yet to be resolved. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, that, that was that was certainly a, a hot topic at um, certainly U CEPT European regulatory level. Um, we've only got a couple more minutes. Um, I just want to quickly um, oh, looking at the the poll that we did before. Um, mm -hmm. By far the bulk, sixty four percent of people went for manufacturing as the most interesting. Uh, I, I suppose under industrial five G, I, mean, I wouldn't normally call a store as uh, as industrial or even perhaps warehousing. So yeah, it, it, that and, uh, airports and ports collectively were thirteen percent, which isn't that great, and about the same as distribution. But uh, manufacturing seems to be the, uh, the you know, among, among the the sample of people on the on the on the call seems to be <clears> the top of the list. Um, one other, I think, last last sort of question, or last question, and then uh, and I'll ask people to sort of do a, sort of an answer and then a final comment on this. Um, edge computing and mech has picked up a couple of times. Um, yeah, I've got in my own mind. I'm trying to work out whether private cellular and edge computing are combined. I know that's in the vision, or if actually they're going to end up on relatively different paths. There might be one might might be driving the adoption of the other, but you might find there's an Amazon outpost with a private 5G network and then or similar. Do you see them integrated, combined, or is edge computing someone else's problem? I think they're not integrated initially. I think they would be combined because I think what comes out of the 5G network or the private network would be fed into the edge edge compute Microsoft, the IBM, et cetera. I think from the perspective of most of these companies, industrial companies that are very sensitive about their data, I would not think that they would want their data in, in with a with a RAN network and that they want it to would to sit separate. But I think very much it's going to develop together the applications the the data generation and what goes into that data generation. 